Today we're going to perform an activity, the purpose of which is to find the index of refraction for a piece of glass. There's a picture up on the board right now with a piece of glass sitting on a piece of paper. You are going to uh, repeat what you see up on the board right now. You're going to put a piece of glass on a piece of paper, although, having said that, we found this morning that it tended to work pretty good, worked a little bit better if you used lined paper as opposed to a blank paper like this. Not a big deal, okay, but it's a little bit easier if you have those lines as a reference. Notice something in the bottom corner here. This is a, a laser. Now, it's a dollar store, $2 laser, so they tend to fall apart fairly easily. They are, the good news is, they are uh, pretty low power output, so safety is not much of a concern for us, although we do want to stay away from shining it in people's eyes or even even swinging it around the room so that it could accidentally go into people's eyes. The reality is the power is very, very low for this, so in all likelihood, even if for a fraction of a second it went into somebody's eyes, it wouldn't damage those eyes, but we want to avoid that just in case, avoid any possibility of, of damage to anybody's eyes. Okay, keep it on the table. You're going to turn on that laser. Because it's a dollar store laser, sometimes the switch isn't that great too. Sometimes you've got to push on it a little bit harder or kind of let off a little bit to make it work. But in the end, you should be able to make it work. Okay, if the batteries are working at least, you should be able to make it work. Just play around with it and you'll see the laser beam come out here. That laser beam, that red laser beam is going to, it's going to shine on that block of glass. Now, of course, when light goes from air, which it's in right now, to glass, what's going to happen to it? Speed up or slow down? It's going to slow down. So as it slows down, it's going to bend toward the normal line, which I don't even have drawn here. Okay? You should, when as soon as you put this piece of glass down, trace the boundary there. Trace a straight line at the boundary just by using your pencil against the piece of glass. And also create a normal line, which is exactly at 90 degrees to that boundary. You can see here now that I've got a laser beam striking the boundary where my normal line intersects with that boundary. You can see that my angle of refraction, which I'm going to label right here as theta 2, is smaller than my angle of incidence that I'm going to label right there as theta 1. It's always going to be smaller. Now, you're also going to notice when you actually do this for real that this laser beam is going to strike the boundary between the glass and the air on the other side, and then it's going to speed up going to bend back this way. We don't really care about this beam out here. It's going to be there. We don't really care about it because we're trying to analyze this interaction right here. But we are going to use it for one thing, and that's to determine what theta 2 is. So here's what I'd like you to do at this point. Okay, I want you to put a little dot or an X or something to indicate exactly where the laser beam leaves the laser. I also want you to put a dot or an X or something right here where the laser beam enters the piece of glass. Finally, I want you to put a dot or an X right here where the laser beam leaves the glass. Now, we don't care about this. Even though you'll see that, we don't care about that. You don't need to trace that over okay, on the paper. And the reality is, once you've got these dots uh, pl plotted here, we can take away we can completely take away the glass. We can completely take away everything. Okay, the reality is we can redraw that by simply joining those dots. And then we can measure from your normal line theta 2, and we can measure from your normal line over here theta 1. Does that make sense? So you've got one piece of data, one trial for theta 1, and then you one trial for, this should say theta 2 actually, one trial for theta 2. Then you're going to repeat this with a different theta 1. I don't care what you use. Go up by 5s, go up by 10s, go up by 6.8s. I don't care. Okay, it, maybe you want to go 13 degrees, 27 degrees, 49 degrees, uh, 28 degrees. You don't even have to go in order. It doesn't matter. As long as you have 10 different values of theta 1 and 10 corresponding values of theta 2. So far, so good? That's data. Remember, we talked about our last activity. We only want what we record in the room here as our data in our data table. The next table is going to be analysis. This should not be included with data because you're doing something with your data for this. 
literally all I'm asking you to do for analysis, at least so far, is to calculate the sine of each of those angles. Sine, let's say my first angle was 30 degrees, then sine 30 would be 0 0.5. Okay, whatever it is, punch it into a calculator, get the sign of each of those angles. I'll show you how to do it on a spreadsheet as well, um, after you've actually got your data collected, if you want to take that shortcut. Do the same thing for theta 2. Notice here, the units for theta 1 are degrees. What are the units for theta 2? Uh, sorry, for uh, sine theta 1? There are no units for the trigonometric function, right? For sine, cos, and tan. It's just a number. So you're not going to include units on the bottom here. Once you've got a table for sine theta 1 and for sine theta 2, what do you think you're going to do with that? What do you think you're going to do with that? Was that a yawn or is that a, an answer? Do you have an answer for me too? It'd be better after a yawn like that. Yeah. You're going to graph it. Now, Stephen, which, which, uh, which uh, column of your table is going to go on the x-axis? Sine theta 1 or sine theta 2? No. Other one. Always the first column goes on the x-axis, the second column goes on the y-axis. So, you're going to get a graph that looks like this. Sine theta 1 on the x-axis, sine theta 2 on the y-axis. This is odd. Like, we've never seen a graph with trigonometry in it before, right? sine theta something. It would be one thing to say theta 2 and theta 1, which would be kind of odd, because they're not like meters or something like that that we're used to, used to graphing. But sine theta is even worse. That's okay. Listen, we're going to get a question on a diploma exam where we have to analyze a graph, in all likelihood a graph that we've never seen before. If we get lucky, maybe it's this one or another one that we've looked at. But if we do get that, then we got lucky. We have to be able to analyze any graph that we see, whether we've, whether we've seen it before or not. See, this is one you've never seen before. How do we analyze this? Well, don't get thrown off by the fact that it's sine on both axes. Just go about your business and do what you got to do. This, by the way, will be a straight line, or it should be pretty close to a straight line. Here's the instructions. Get an equation. We've done this before, several times before now, right? This should be coming familiar to you. Get an equation from your graph. Straight line graph is y because mx plus b always. What appears on the y-axis of this graph, Luke? What's on the y-axis? Sine theta 2, right. So let's replace y with sine theta 2. m is the slope. Let's replace m with the word slope because we don't want to get m mixed up with mass. Uh, Jake, what's on the x-axis here? Sine theta 1. So let's put sine theta 1 right there. Okay, what's B stand for? All you people that did really well in math 9. What does B stand for? Dustin? It's the y-intercept. In 90 or 95% of graphs that you see, there will be no y-intercept. It'll go through the origin. That'll be the case here. Now in the next activity we do, there will be a y-intercept, and it'll be really important. We'll deal with that when the time comes. Okay? For this one, and for all the other ones we've done to this point, there is no y-intercept, or there shouldn't be a y-intercept anyways. Now what you want to do is come up with an equation from your data sheet. And you want to come up with an equation on your data sheet that has the same variables as this one has for my graph. What equation on my data sheet has sine theta 2 and sine theta 1 in it? It doesn't have to look like this. It just has to have those, have those variables in it. Which one? Yeah, Snell's Law, right? So we're going to say sine theta 1 over sine theta 2 equals v1 over v2, lambda 1 over lambda 2 equals n2 over n1. We only ever use two parts of that equation. Since I'm trying to find, in this case, the index of refraction of that piece of glass, I'm going to use the n2 and n1 part of it, along with sine theta 1 and sine theta 2. Now what you've got to do is rearrange that to solve for the same variable as the equation on the left solved for. So in other words, solve for sine theta 2. That goes up by multiplying. This goes up by multiplying. This goes down by dividing ends up being sine theta 2 equals n1 over n2 times sine theta 1. Okay, so we've solved for sine theta 2 in both of those 
equations, the one that I got from my graph and the one that I got from my data sheet. Is this ringing a bell, even though we're dealing with trigonometry instead of just, you know, variables like position and stuff? This process that we're going through ringing a bell from what we've done in a number of other activities? Cross off things that appear in bold. Sine theta 2 appears in bold. Sine theta 1 appears in bold. What are we left with? The slope is n1 over n2. Let's go back to this for a second. What are we solving for here? The purpose of this was to find the index of refraction of the glass. Is the glass n1 or is it n2? Is the air n1 or n2? Which one's n1? Air or glass? Doesn't? Air is n1. We're going from air, right? And we know the index of refraction of air already is 1.00. We're solving for n2. So let's go back to this again. We know the value of n1 is 1.00. We just found the value of the slope. We're solving for n2. N2 is going to be 1.00, right, the index of refraction of air, divided by whatever you got for the slope there. And because it's glass, it should be somewhere in the range of 1.5-ish, okay, although you may get a number that's a little bit more, a little bit less. If you measure your angles well and you're careful with it, you should get good data here. You should get a number for the index of refraction that is in that range of 1.5. If you get 14.7, something's wrong. If you get 0 0.1, something's even more wrong. Because you've got to get a number that's bigger than 1. But you should, again, end up within that, somewhere in that range of 1 1.4, 1 1.5, 1 1.6. Aiden? If we're solving for N2 right here, why can't we use this equation? Say n1 is 1.00. We know what theta 2 is. Solve for n2. The only problem with that, Aiden, okay, that's a good question. That relies on you using one data point. Okay, you measured theta 2. Okay, we know what n1 is. We can solve for n2 that way. Yes, you can. The problem is if that one data point was a bad data point, then you're going to end up with a number for n2 that's way, way off, right? When we plot a graph, we can get a number that's way, way off in one of our data points, even a couple data points, but the graph kind of mitigates that. The graph kind of says, like, like, look, we messed up on a couple data points, but we can see the clear trend goes like this. Okay, and the average of all those crazy points ends up being this. So it ends up, it ends up not relying on extremes. Does that make sense? Um, if theta 2 is perfect, was a perfect measurement, then yeah, that would work. But we're never guaranteed that it's a perfect measurement. Even when we think it is, sometimes it's not, right? So then you've got to do a conclusion. Right? What's your conclusion? Well, the whole problem was to find the index of refraction of glass, right? So your conclusion would be the index of refraction of glass is blank. And I know this because, well, tell me how you know it justify it. And then, of course, sources of error. We want to have two or three pretty good sources of error. They tell me things that, that could have been better. All right? Any questions on that?